Welcome to Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm flying solo and we're going to be talking about the aftermath of our European performance last night, Celtic progressing into the Europa League playoff courtesy of a slim one nothing defeat uh, of Riga. What did you think of that? What did you make of the performance? What did you make of Neil Lennon's lineup? Um, did he choose the right personnel? Did we play the correct formation? These are all the questions that are currently being asked amongst the Celtic support. And I ask the question, is the hysteria justified? I've seen a lot of, in fact, there's been mass hysteria surrounding last night's performance and the fact that we just narrowly um, squeezed into the Europa League playoffs, where, of course, we will be playing Sarajevo of Bosnia. Uh, We're aware of Sarajevo having met them last year and defeated them uh, 5-2 in aggregate. It sounds comfortable, but uh, over the two legs, uh, I remember the the home leg being a wee bit less comfortable than the away game. This is going to be a one-off against Sarajevo next Thursday. We'll be covering that game on A Celtic State of Mind and uh, we'll be covering the game live. How do you think that will go? We've got another game. They're coming in thick and fast. We've got another game on Sunday against Hibs. Hibs are a side who I actually um, rate very highly. I think a lot of people are thinking along those lines at this moment in time. I did predict at the beginning of the season that they would be pushing for second spot. That might have a lot to do with the managerial um, partnership of Jack Cross and John Potter because I've got a soft spot for them. I think that they're a great management team. I think that they're going to do very well with Hibs uh, this season. And I do predict that they're going to be the uh, second force in Scotland this season after Celtic, of course. We were talking yesterday about how the Scottish game is going to be impacted again and further uh, through the coronavirus following the uh, following the um, the announcement that the Scottish government n- may not allow uh, football to be played in Scotland until uh, March or or so so uh, there is no sound quality issues whatsoever so Tosh Bear um, or commenting on YouTube I don't know if there are any issues at your end The sound is all up and running At this end uh, The mics are on, the cameras are on As you can see I'm on my own If you ever want to join us on a Celtic State of Mind Pay us a visit, get on the show Tell us your thoughts, get involved in the discussion That's what it's all about And the comments are coming in thick and fast On Twitter, Facebook and YouTube I'm going to work my way through as many of them as possible, because it's just me and you guys out there today. So a few points. First and foremost, massive game against Hibs on Sunday. I think uh, you know Jack Ross and John Potter have got a, a really decent side. They've bought extremely well, and they've uh, they've started off really well. Actually, they probably could have beat Rangers uh, last week. I think they were unlucky and a wee bit disappointed actually not to to beat them after the two two draw. Um, after that, there was a lot of stick uh, flying around uh, about uh, the boy Porteous. There was people actually saying that maybe Celtic should be interested in him. I think he's a good enough player. Certainly seems to be uh, doing well at Hibs. And, you know, just because he's played well against Rangers doesn't mean to say that we should be interested in him. We've got our own troubles at the moment in terms of players who may or may not be interested in various clubs all over Europe. I've been watching this morning with interest um, the English Premiership or the English English Premier League, rather, uh, transfer roundup. I, I hear no mentions whatsoever of any interest in some of the Celtic stars who are apparently attracting interest. And those players are uh, Olivier Encham, Chris Ayer and Odson Eduard. Uh, I think there's also going to be some interest in the likes of Ryan Christie who hasn't yet signed a new contract so we'll have a wee chat about that as well. I've been seeing a lot of um, talk around Eduard's performance last night and uh, some people were asking whether or not he was interested. I don't think it comes into that. I really don't. I honestly don't think um, you know last night's performance had anything to do with uh, Eduard's attitude. Um, one broadcaster questioning his attitude um, as well as Ayers, 
uh, and Julian's, which is a wee bit concerning, but I don't know where that information comes from or, or if it was an observation. He certainly couldn't be observing Julian last night because he was out. So, what did you think of the starting lineup? And um, I mean, I seen Lennon getting quite a bit of stick after the game. I think I would uh, maybe counter that slightly, and this might be controversial by saying that you know he made the right changes. He actually did make the right changes. Um, I, I was questioning. Uh, El Yunusi for Eduard, I thought that was a, an unusual one at the time. Uh, but then Eduard, you know, he was maybe tiring. Uh, I just thought that he's a type of player who, although he was surrounded by three defenders at all times, he could give you something in and around the box. And, um, you know, in the last 10 minutes, Frimpong created three chances. Uh, young Frimpong created three chances down the right. He was brilliant actually when he came on, wasn't he? He came on about 31 minutes, 32 minutes into the game due to an injury uh, on James Forrest. And it looks as though Forrest is going to miss the game against Hibs, which is unfortunate because, you know, it would have been good to have maybe even push Forrest out left and start with Frimpong. Even though El Yunusi came on and scored the winning goal, such an important goal. I'm now doubting whether his best position is out wide left. Um, he seems to be doing better in the middle. And uh, obviously that was an excellent finish last night. But it was all down, really down to the the performance of Frimpong. Celtic, for me, weren't really in any danger last night. I can understand because it was, it was an uninspiring performance. We scraped through. It was a last minute goal. We certainly didn't want extra time. Uh, but... We were dominant, that's that's the word used by Lennon and I don't think we can argue with that. 71% possession against 29 away from home. Um, I've seen a few comments last night on Twitter saying that if it was a two-legged affair and we went over there and won one nil, we'd be delighted. Granted, we would be. But unfortunately, it is a, it's a one-off and the next game's going to be a one-off as well. And, you know, last night proved there are no easy rounds, there's no easy games, no easy ties in Europe at this moment in time. I had predicted 3 nothing, um, and I had predicted that uh, Albion Ayeti was going to score the first goal. He was not selected. I was quite surprised that we didn't maintain the the partnership of Ayeti and Edward that we've seen some good signs of. And we started off with Edward. He came off, he was up against it, wasn't he? I mean, there was one point where he's come back 30, 40 yards uh, to get involved in the play because, he, you know, every time he gets the ball, he's got the back to go, he's got three players round about him and uh, it was difficult for him. Frimpong was the best out ball we had all night. I think that uh, Taylor was, uh, you know, played his usual game, got loads of the ball down the left, but there definitely seems to be an imbalance between the right-hand side of the park and the left. It would be fantastic if we could try and you know, balance that off a wee bit. You know, we've seen Forrest playing out on the left and he's very effective on the left. I think uh, Forrest comes in, he likes to come in on his right foot. Unfortunately, he's going to be injured. Who do we start out wide left? Um, it wouldn't surprise me if Neil Lennon started again with Taylor. The the issue, the big issue with Taylor, I think, is getting past his man, getting the crosses in. Um, very much the opposite of what Frimpong was doing last night. So, Let's go through some of the comments that are coming in via YouTube, Twitter and Facebook. And on YouTube, if you're watching the show on YouTube, please subscribe to us because uh, we are building up our YouTube following. It's free to subscribe and you'll get daily content uh, from a Celtic state of mind. And we are producing other content as well, live shows, podcasts and uh, pre-recorded TV style shows. So we're going to keep them coming. We might even get a, a live event at some point, uh, definitely not this year, uh, but we are planning some live events next year and we're going to be publishing our first book very, very soon. I'll tell you all about that at some stage during the show. So, Jean Paul II, or is it Jean Paul II? If that was a two-legged tie, would anyone be moaning about last night's result? I don't think so. Well, you know, Paul the Tim, actually it was, that i seen tweeting that last night and, you know, Paul would have been at the game, I'm sure, if we were allowed. Um, he made that point and it's a good one. No, I don't think there'd been much groans and moans. We were just happy to get over there and get the result. And I think, you know, in the past, 
oh, you get you get kind of criticised whatever you say, really, to be honest with you. Um, I was critical of Neil Lennon after the Ferenc Varos defeat uh, a month ago. Uh, I then came into some criticism myself for having the audacity for criticising the manager for not playing a striker, um, you know, as part of the, the starting lineup. Last night, I'm defending him. I'm defending Neil Lennon after last night. I don't think it was an inspiring performance. We scraped through against Riga. And, um, but what I would say is that, you know, we weren't really in any danger. And I think there was one point where Beaton uh, came to our rescue. It was a three on one situation. Beaton, who, by the way, he might have been overshadowed by Frimpong because of what Frimpong did when he came on. But Beaton had a, a very assured game at centre half. And I'm now looking at him as someone who might start. He might start on Sunday because obviously Julian's been carrying this back injury. Uh, we'll need to wait for an update on his fitness to see if Julian will be considered to start against Hibs. Um, and if not, Beaton did enough last night, didn't he? He looked fairly assured when he came on against Livingston. He, he obviously, you know, he likes having the ball at his feet, but I thought he looked really good. You know, Duffy was a guy that Celtic fans, me included, uh, were screaming for. We, we were desperate for Duffy to come in. Certainly not writing him off, but I don't think he was great last night. He looked um, a wee bit ropey. He gave the ball away far too often for my liking. Uh, looking at Chris Iyer, the man who is uh, at the centre of a lot of speculation, um, mainly from Italian football. AC Milan might be interested in him. He's on a short list, certainly. How did he play last night? I thought he played well. He got loads of the ball. He didn't go on any of his usual, usual marauding runs where he can sometimes uh, make up 40, 50 yards. He played a lot of safe balls. I think uh, Scott Brown played a lot of safe balls last night as well. But once we realised that Frimpong was the out ball, and I think Christie went over there to, to support him. Christie was all over the park. you seen him supporting Frimpong. you seen him supporting um, Taylor as well on the left. And, you know, it was a bit of a hit or miss with regards to the, the set plays from Christie, but he did play in Frimpong. Um, which led to the goal. So there was there was several players I think came out uh, at last night's performance pretty well. But uh, generally, a lot of Celtic fans were unhappy this morning. So let's also have a look at IH Decorating, who's commenting on YouTube, and he says that the the worry for me is how often we have looked laboured and lacking spark this season. The performance at Kilmarnock earlier in the season has been served up time and time again. Well, I did open up by saying, you know, that uh, last night certainly was fairly uninspiring and um, I'm sure you'll agree with that. However, a lot of the teams that we're playing are playing that type of game, aren't they? Uh, you know, uh, Livingston, Kilmarnock and I think last night was the same. We're, we're playing with a huge amount of players behind the ball, 9-10 outfield players behind the ball um, at any one time. Sometimes a whole team behind the ball. It's hard to break it down. Uh, St Mirren, we saw it against St Mirren as well and uh, following that game, you know, Edward was being criticised for not being very effective but that's a difficult game for a lone striker uh, to play as, as he was last night. So, yeah, we are playing up there, I'm not making excuses, I'm just trying to balance that one out. Um, it's not been very excited, exciting a lot of the time. Um, we need to raise our game on Sunday, there's no doubt about that whatsoever. Joe Porter, Joe. You seem to get involved in most of our broadcasts, so thanks for your support and thanks for getting involved. You're commenting on YouTube. Riga had never lost a home game in Europe until last night, so well done Celtic. These dire games will happen. The important thing is to win, and that's what they did. I agree with that, I really do. And, and you know, you also get criticised for um, having the attitude of a win's a win. Um, I'm not going into this blind, I'm not going into it ignoring any of the, the frailties that we have seen uh, over the piece because I know that we're not firing all, all cylinders at the moment but I think we do get some insights from the types of performances that we saw from the likes of Frimpong and uh, Ryan Christie I thought Ryan Christie was one of our best players when I looked into the midfield McGregor was his usual self energetic all over the park um, willing to take responsibility take the ball and try and make something happen I think Taylor, I was looking at Taylor quite closely last night watching the game with Stevie Mullen, the St. Rock's president, and Taylor 
seems to go for the easy option a lot of the time. I don't know if it's a confidence thing uh, with Taylor where he'll pass the ball 10 yards sideways or back the way rather than trying to take on his man, rather than swinging in across. There was one occasion actually where you know, Christie played an excellent pass, one of the best balls of the evening actually, uh, over the top and it was met with Taylor's head. If he just got over that, you know, that that was an excellent chance, but he just, he was under the ball and, and uh, headed it over, which was unfortunate. It would have done his confidence the world of good. I know he set up a goal against Livy. I know he set up a couple of goals against Hamilton. Um, I'd love to see his stats because they might surprise me. It may well be that he's getting so much of the ball uh, that it's highlighting it more. But it was unfortunate in many ways that uh, Forrest got injured last night because I would like to see him on the left, maybe against Hibs. But it was fortunate because obviously it resulted in the introduction of Jeremy Frimpong. Now, Jeremy Frimpong, when he first came into the Celtic side, and you remember these performances, um, particularly at the Celtic part, but also the game up at Pataudry, he was electrifying, wasn't he? I mean, you gave him the ball, and he was just leaving a, a trail of players in his wake. Jinky wee player. Um, I say to Jim Simonetti, who appreciated it, he had the spirit of Jinky. Wasn't comparing them before anybody starts lambasting me for using both of those names in the same breath. But he had that ability to take on a man or two or three and get the ball in. A big criticism was the final ball. But I think what we saw last night was that, that certainly that part of his game, was was excellent last night. He set up three really good chan- chances in the last 10 minutes. Uh, one of them, I don't know how it's stayed out, a Yeti. Um, it, you know, it was blocked on the line from the defender. The second one, I think a Yeti was either leaving it for Edward at the back post. I don't know if there was a shout or if he was trying to jump over it and back heel it. I'm not quite sure what was going on there. But two excellent chances preceded the, the, the winning goal. Um, and it was just a sense of relief, wasn't it? When, when uh, El Yunusi struck home from about 12 yards, excellent technique uh, to get his body around that uh, sideways and get the ball in uh, and nestling into the corner of the net. El Yunusi, I thought, was an excellent bit of business by Celtic when we brought him in again on, on loan. Uh, I know that after his injury last season, he wasn't back to his best, um, but I did see flashes of an excellent player in there uh, last season before his injury and before the, the League Cup final where he came back in too early. So I was delighted when we we renegotiated a, a deal uh, with Southampton to bring him in. I was thinking that it might have helped the arrival of Ayeti. It might have helped both players actually because they knew one another uh, from their time in Basel or Baal, depending on, on how you pronounce that these days. So I was delighted to see El Yunusi scoring because... I think, you know, I've been disappointed with his performances over the piece this season. I think the question now is, where do we play him? He might be the best option out left. I don't think it's his best position, to be honest. He seems to be better coming in. It was a point made by Lawrence Connolly on one of the the previous broadcasts, and I've got to agree with Lawrence, that uh, when he comes inside, he seems to look very comfortable in the centre of the pitch. Uh, last night's finish was absolutely sublime. So uh, that will be interesting to see how we start on Sunday. It seems to be interesting every time we see the time the team line up. Um, now, Richard McMinn, you're commenting on YouTube. Welcome to the show, Richard. The concern for me is that there seems to be no solution to the lacklustre play. A solution must be found before it is too late. What do you think of that? I mean... Again, is it the personnel? Is it maybe trying to freshen things up in the middle of the pitch? Um, we're at the moment we're playing with McGregor and Scott Brown, and there's been loads of comments in relation to whether that is the best partnership in that area of the park. Should we be resting Brown? I can't see it happening on Sunday. You know, if we were going to rest him, it would have happened before now, probably against Livy. I reckon that would have been the game that uh, Neil Lennon was looking to maybe rest Bruni um, or. Do we just continue with that? Because I think the, the other options we've got there, obviously, is uh, maybe a switch of position for someone else who's already playing, such as Christy. I don't think he's a central midfielder. He's far more comfortable in front of the midfield. Uh, I think uh, in Cham's far more comfortable in front of the midfield as well. So then you're maybe looking at Turnbull, who were brought in, and who was a very exciting prospect, who is a very exciting prospect, and it would be great maybe to see a wee bit more of him, of him, but I don't think 
Sunday's game is going to be the game where we start tinkering with the middle of the park. I don't think Scott Brown's going to be rested against his former club. What do you reckon, Richard, or anyone else who's tuning in? And uh, Kenny McAdam. Obviously good to get the win last night, but once again, the team performed poorly. We're making games much more difficult than they should be. Lennon's team selections are baffling. Well, I did look at the, the team selection last night. My um, predicted 11 was uh, Barkas and goals. I was uh, hoping that we started with Iron Duffy at the back with Elham- Elhamid and Taylor right and left, simply because we were playing away from home. I didn't see us starting with three central defenders. Forrest, McGregor, Brown and Christie with uh, Eddie and Ayeti. So a couple of changes there. Um, and I think... You know, he got the result. He got the result. So, you know, I can't really question it, although we can certainly strip back the performance and look at some of the the pros and cons of that. Um, Eddie and Ayeti playing together is something that uh, I've been banging on about, something that I find it really exciting, that partnership. And I hope to see them um, playing together against Hibs on Sunday. It's a home game. Maybe I'm old-fashioned. I'd love to see Celtic playing with two up front, particularly at home. I think that's a partnership we need to see developing. Um, Edward last night, I've heard people saying that he looks disinterested. I disagree with that. I think that's always his demeanour. Um, doesn't matter if he's scoring hat-tricks or he's struggling to get into the game. I always think that's his demeanour. He has that unfortunate knack of looking disinterested, but I don't think he is. Um, I think when Encham came off, he was... He was disappointed, as most professional footballers are. He, he looked pretty disappointed as he was coming off the field to play. But it might have just been in the um, direct aftermath of the substitution. Does Mincham start on, on Sunday? Um, how are we going to line up? Let me know your thoughts on that. Obviously, we will have a pre-match. I'll be joined by a couple of the Axon pundits um, on Sunday. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Now... Uh, Gary McDowell, teams are going to sit in and make it hard for us to break them down. That's where we need the width and quality crosses in the box like like Frimpong was doing last night. You know what, Gary? It sounds simplistic, but I agree with you. I actually do agree with you. And I think that if we got the same option on the left-hand side as we had last night, then that's what opens up the teams. That's what stretches the teams. We were really finding it difficult, weren't we, against Kilmarnock? And that's when, obviously, you need to have those options on the bench. Players you can call on, the creative types who can come in and maybe create and craft a chance. Um, We've got other creative players who are maybe coming back to full fitness, such as Mikey Johnson, who hasn't played a part this season. Again, I'm going to use their names again. I keep getting told to leave them out of it, but Roger and Griffiths are still part of the first team squad. Um, Are they options on the bench to come in and maybe try and create something? They're not fit, but they're certainly not going to start at the moment. Um, I seen a, I read an article rather this morning around uh, Karim Mokodembele um, and whether or not he should be there or thereabouts. I can't see that happening at the moment. I really can't because obviously there are there are suggestions uh, coming out of Celtic that he may not be happy. He may not be happy at the moment, and um, I don't know what he, he can't be happy about. He certainly. He shouldn't be expecting to start games for Celtic at this stage based on um, the hype. Because at the moment, you've got to look at what he's doing, obviously, when he gets an opportunity in the first team. Neil Lennon's watching him at training every single day and Lennon will know when uh, the time is right to bring in uh, the, the young lad who's only 17. I don't think it helps when his contemporaries... Um, are flying the nest and going to places such as Blackburn Rovers and Bayern Munich. Um, I don't think that that's useful at all for Celtic when we're looking to progress a player like Dembele because it may turn his head. He may be looking at some of the the vast improvements in wages, for example, um, that a player at Bayern Munich might get at the age of 17 against what someone at Celtic might get. And people of his age may be coming a wee bit impatient. And unless you are two things, one, exceptionally talented, but also two, exceptionally lucky. And I mean lucky in respect of, let's look at the last 17-year-old to come into Celtic and to staple himself into the Celtic team. And that was Kieran Tierney. 
Now, I'm not calling Hakeem Tierney lucky to be there, but we all know the uh, circumstances around Tierney's rise to the first team. So he was exceptionally talented. And uh, the second part of that equation is that he was exceptionally lucky that day that uh, Celtic needed a left back um, in the bounce game. And he was the guy that that played in that game and he impressed Ronnie Dyla. Now, Karamoko Dembele has been, you know, more hyped than any Celtic youth player since his Lanferous. And he made it into the team. He made his debut um, as a 16-year-old. He made his European debut as a 16-year-old youngest Celtic player to play in Europe. Um, he sat on the bench against Hearts in the Scottish Cup final. So the development... Um, it was rapid, it was meteoric. You know, one minute he's playing for Scotland, the next minute it's England. There was a tug of war on an international level. The hype about that boy playing for, you know, at the age of 13 for the, the development stroke reserve team. I know it's not in a reserve league, but it is the second string. Um, it was intense, wasn't it? And um, it's hit a brick wall at the moment. I think there's a few reasons for that. One is he's maybe a wee bit disillusioned, and um, that's disappointing. Because at his age, when you're looking at the development of players and the importance of this season, he would have got a chance. He might still get a chance to play several games this season. We've got a lot of competitions coming up. You look at last night. Now, if uh, Dembele was sitting on that bench, um, as he had been at the beginning of the season, and you know James Forrest gets injured, You've maybe got two options. Obviously, Neil Lennon picked the correct option last night anyway by bringing on Frimpong. He was the game changer. But one of the options might have been Dembele at some point this season uh, when that injury happens. I'm not saying necessarily last night. Uh, but Dembele has either talked himself off that bench or you know he's not performing in training. So we'll need to have a look at that. Uh, I'd love to see him develop and become a part of the Celtic side, I really would. So um, I think that what we would love to see is we'd love to see a bit of that balance and having the left side as exciting and as creative as Frimpong was last night on the right. Can James E. Forrest give us that? We've seen flashes of him playing on the left. I think he's uh, he's an excellent player. I stand up for James e quite a lot on the podcast. He's unfortunately injured. We're also waiting for Mikey Forrest to come back. Mikey Forrest, Mikey Johnston to come back. I'm thinking Mikey Forrester, train spotting. Um, Mikey Johnston to come back. He's uh, fighting back to fitness. And I think that that's quite a, an exciting uh, reintroduction to the team. If we can get wee Mikey back, uh, turn it up on the left-hand side. We've got Frimpong on the right. I think that's quite exciting to look forward to that as well. Joe Porter. So much negativity around a win. Can you imagine if we lost? Actually, Joe, I can't. I cannot imagine losing that game last night. I was so delighted. Um, you know the circumstances where it was a poor. It was a poor night. It wasn't a great performance. It certainly wasn't a. Yeah, it wasn't a bad performance. You know, it's not as if we were under the cosh and Barkas is pulling saves and uh, last minute ditch ta- tackles from. I have saved the day because it wasn't that type of game. It was all Celtic possession. It was 71% Celtic. Uh, we were only able to, to score one goal, but we crafted a few chances. I mean, and Cham had an excellent effort in the first half and it was a fingertip save over the bar. That was a type of thing we were going to score in, uh, in the first half anyway, because we were really struggling to break down the defence uh, of Riga who did exactly what I think they went out to do. They probably would have been ha- happy to go into extra time to see if they could maybe nip, uh, or sorry, nick a, a counter-attacking goal. I was delighted that it didn't get to that stage because, yeah, we'd be sitting here this morning, uh, Joe, uh, devastated really at uh, where that left us in Europe because Europe's important to Celtic every season. But I think this season there's a wee added importance and that is due to the fact that the financial element of uh, any European competition adds to the Celtic coffers. And we, like every club, are going to be affected by the pandemic. Um, We are now facing down a situation which may be another six months before we're back into football stadiums. Unthinkable, isn't isn't it? But it's the reality of it. So that then leaves us to wonder um, where we're going to be in six months' time. Um, it, it makes us wonder, are we going to cash in on some of our um, assets? As I say, I was looking at some of the speculation around the English game, uh, the English game being obviously where a lot of the money is. Um, 
And they don't seem to be uh, commenting on players like Encham, who previously uh, was said to be interesting Southampton, or Eduard, who apparently was interested in Villa and Arsenal. I don't see them connected or linked uh, on any of the, the news bulletins that I've been watching this week. It may well be that you know Celtic are doing their business privately, which they are good at, let's be honest. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if we had a couple of players on our sites, but um, we'll need to wait and see. Will we play the loan market? I think it's it's an option. We're talking about balancing the side. Let me throw in one of my, my favourites again and, and saying would Paddy Roberts maybe open up the left-hand side of the park in the same way that Frimpong's opening up the right-hand side. Is that what we need? Another creative winger? I'd love it. I really would. And that isn't a dig at um, Greg Taylor. I think Greg Taylor is getting loads of the ball. It's just, you know, he's not creating the chances that that we need to break down these tight defences. Kenny McAdam, you're commenting on YouTube. I agree. Uh, he's agreeing with Richard, who commented earlier, Lennon waits far too long to recognise an act when either formation or personnel needs to be changed to affect a game positively. It's a criticism here a lot, isn't you, Lennon? It's one I've used myself. Sometimes you think, well, he's never going to make a change at half-time. Um, the Frimpong change was forced on him, you know, uh, we, we give credit to Frimpong. It was forced on on Lenny, but he did he did bring in El Yunusi and he did uh, obviously position him in the centre of the park, and we scored the goal. So let's not get too bogged down with criticising Neil Lennon. I looked at Neil Lennon after the game, and uh, I, I thought back to some comments that were made during the week um, by a, a well known Scottish pundit uh, who seemed to be able to tell tell us what Neil Lennon was thinking and feeling and how he was just by looking in his eyes. I mean, Neil Lennon was uh, understandably um, delighted after the game. Um, he looked a bit drawn, it must be said, but it's, it's a stressful time for, for Lenny. I think it's a stressful time for every Celtic player. Can you imagine this, this, the added um, kind of pressure? It's, it's a pressure-filled situation to be playing uh, and managed, managing Celtic on a day-to-day basis. Huge amounts of pressure. But, I mean, that that's escalating this season because of the 10 in a row. Um, but also because there's all the added stresses around the, the COVID situation. And I did think uh, Lenny looked a wee bit kind of um, relieved last night. And that's understandable. But let's give Lenny a wee bit of credit. You know, he made that, that choice. He, he made the substitution that mattered last night. First one was, was forced on him. But when he brings on El Yunusi uh, for Eduard, and I'm sitting here questioning it, uh, it worked out well. So fair play to Lenny. I gave you stick after Ferenc Varos, and I'm going to support you against uh, Riga. I think, yeah, it was uninspiring, but we got through. And at this moment in time, I'm happy with that. You get knocked out of the Champions League, and it's devastating. And you talk about it all week, as we have, and we're still talking about it now a month later. I think it was four weeks ago we knocked out, got knocked out by Ferenc Varos. Um, Celtic need to be at that top table. We all know that. There's no excuses. But we now have the Europa League, and I'm, I'm really desperately wanting to be in the group stages. And I'll be excited to, to see the draw and everything else if we're able to negotiate the tie against Sarajevo. And I remember when we, we drew Sarajevo last season in the Champions League qualifier. And I was talking to Kevin Graham. Kevin, who obviously is a very important part of the Celtic State of Mind team. And he's a good friend of mine uh, as well. And I've got friendly with, with him through the podcast, so I've got to be thankful for that as well. And Kevin and I were chatting about the last time Sarajevo um, were at Celtic Park because we know it was the first time we'd played them in a football sense. Um, I thought back to 1993 and it was the first gig I ever went to. It, and it was at Celtic Park, strangely enough. And it was U2. Now, you 2 will divide opinion. They'll divide opinion on this podcast and, and elsewhere. But back then, I loved U2, you know. It was, um, they had come back with Acting Baby. Uh, and then it was a Zoo TV tour. And uh, what was the name of the album? Zuropa. Yeah, Zuropa had just come out. And they were playing a gig at Celtic Park. My first gig, my first concert. And it was at the time where Bono used to do that thing where he would um, phone, you know, important people uh, on the planet to try and uh, go live to them and ask them questions and put them on the spot in front of a huge audience. And um, at that time, there was a live satellite broadcast to Sarajevo. And um, it was it was really 
at that time, at that age that I was, it was quite harrowing to watch um, because, you know, what the, the girl said is that the bombs and the guns and the grenades and all that were drowning out the sounds of um, her um, her fellow her fellow people who were being uh, beaten and raped at that time. And it was really harrowing. And it, my mind went back to Saraj- Sarajevo and that song that you two did uh, with Pavarotti, Miss Sarajevo, beautiful song. Um, revisit it, it's beautiful. So when I seen Sarajevo uh, were lying in wait for us or we were lying in wait for them as it happened, uh, that's what it took me back to. It took me back to Celtic Park. Uh, and better times when we could all just uh, stand together in groups and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to be playing Sarajevo again away in Bosnia. It's going to be a tough tie. Um, and hopefully between now and Thursday, we don't get any more injuries. Uh, it's a big game against Hibs. We've got to go with our strongest side. Every game is massive. But then we're back again on Thursday. And uh, we'll be covering it all on a Celtic state of mind. So what Kevin did after that discussion about Sarajevo is he wrote a fantastic article and you can read that article on axom.net. So please visit the website www.axom.net and just uh, search for Sarajevo or Kevin Graham and read that article. It was brilliant. Now, on the subject of writing, I'm going to deviate for a second before I come back to your brilliant points that are coming through. You know that I like a bit of writing myself. I've uh, published four books. I've not published them. I've had them published. I wrote them. Um, and Quality Street Gang was my first one. And the latest one is going to come out at some point. I'm not quite sure. I need to speak to the publisher. But it took me five years to write it. It was on the Celtic jersey. But what we're doing at a Celtic state of mind is we're actually publishing books as well. So what I decided to do was speak to David Potter and Tom Campbell. Tom who is based in Canada, David, who is based in Kirkcaldy, uh, two Celtic historians, and no one has written more books on Celtic than David Potter. Tom Campbell is, in my opinion, the finest writer of Celtic books. His writing style is beautiful. He's, He's beautifully written. He's very poetic. He's a fantastic writer. So I put the two of them together and I pitched them a wee idea on a Celtic book called Forever Celtic. Now, this project has been in the works for about two years, and I'm delighted to say that we are nearing completion of that project. Tom and David will have the final manuscript over the next couple of days, just to have a final read-through. And a good friend of mine is designing the cover as we speak, and that book, I hope, will be on the shelves at the end of October. So we're publishing it. A Celtic State of Mind are going to publish it. We're going to sell it direct we're going to sell it direct. So this uh, sponsor's logo that you see above us will be replaced for a while with the book. And that will show you where you can buy it. You'll be able to buy it directly from a Celtic State of Mind. Uh, we have the shop on the website and we'll try and keep it as inexpensive as possible. And we'll try and do the whole thing ourselves, And we'll run um, a, a limited print to see how it goes. Uh, but it's David Potter and Tom Campbell, so obviously it's going to be a good read, and I've read it and I've edited it, so it is a good read, and it's beautifully designed as well. So, we're going to be uh, announcing a release date very, very soon, and it will be available in time for Christmas, so there you go, and that will assist us with the costs that um, it takes to run a Celtic state of mind and allow us to to, uh, broadcast on a daily basis. So please support that project, and we will tell you much more about it in the weeks to come. Talking of Celtic books, let me know what's your favourite Celtic book, because mine is The Glory in the Dream by the aforementioned Tom Campbell with his good friend Pat Woods, who is... If I say Tom Campbell's the finest writer, I would say Pat Woods is the finest researcher of Celtic books. And when they work together, um, the books are always tremendous. But the, the, the best, in my opinion, is The Glory and the Dream. So please let me know a, a wee bit of literature there, just deviating from any disappointment from last night. How could you be disappointed after last night? Uh, now, Tosh Bear, um, you're telling me that you can't hear anything. Hopefully that's at your end because... Everybody else seems to be okay. Paul Sav, YouTube, good to hear from you, Paul, and I'm glad that you're tuning in via YouTube. Anybody else who's tuning in via YouTube who hasn't already subscribed, click subscribe, it's free. We'll keep you updated not only on our broadcasts and our podcasts and our TV shows, 
but also on things like Forever Celtic, which is going to be our first release. We're, we've got other plans. I'm, I'm not going to give too much away, but some of the contributors to Celtic State of Mind are also working on other projects, and we're going to publish them. Um, we're looking to publish books. We're looking to release music, believe it or not. Um, and eventually we'll be doing live events. We'll be doing live events from our very own studio. We'll be doing exhibitions. There's loads of things in the works, some of which we can't do during the pandemic. Um, however, we can release a book, can't we? We can send you out a brand new Celtic book. And it is it's very, very good. I mean, I'm not going to give you too much away, but we'll get the synopsis very soon because obviously it is... Uh, written and it's just currently at the final editing stage John Sweeney he, he keeps picking the wrong players and he needs to rest his favourites like Brown and Forrest and Frimpong did more in 5 minutes than Forrest in half an hour John Sweeney thanks for your comments on YouTube what do you make of that ladies and gents does Neil Lennon continually pick his favourites or his so called favourites I think um, when you look at that the spine of that side at the moment who who are the first names on that team sheet? Uh, Barkas is becoming uh, one of the first names on the team sheet because he's not doing much wrong. I like the fact that he tries to get the ball out quickly, even if it means he does a wee kind of shimmy and a run around his own box. But, um, you know, he tries to get that ball out quickly, be it uh, throwing it or booting it. Um, played a brilliant ball up the wing against Livingston, didn't he? So I like that about Barkas, and he is somebody that, yeah, he's a constant on that team sheet for me. Callum McGregor is the most important player we've got. He's a constant on that team sheet. And I don't think many people would argue with that. If you do, let me know why, because I think he is pivotal to any success that we're going to have. Scott Brown's a captain. So he is one of the first names on the team sheet, I would guess. We've all been talking about resting Bruni. When do you rest them? You can't rest them last night, can you? Away from home in Europe. You can't rest them against Hibs uh, on Sunday. It's a must-win game against Hibs. It's going to be a difficult one. The games may be against the likes of Livingston at home. Maybe you can rest players then. But Eduard had already gone to Neil Lennon and he had asked to be rested. So how many players can you rest? You've seen that it became more difficult uh, than we might have expected against Livy. The scoreline suggests that anyway. I think the performance was more dominant than the scoreline suggested. So yeah, Frimpong did certainly have a fantastic um, impact when he came on last night but we've also seen comments overnight about uh, how Frimpong's a first choice he is now he wasn't before the game last night you know what I mean because his form last night was superb was it superb against Livingston at the weekend we know what Frimpong's capable of he showed it when he first came into the side last night there was the the air of uh, the unknown people didn't really know what to expect and by people I mean the opposition, Celtic players and the management would have known because they see him at training. Um, they sussed him out a wee bit, they doubled up on him, they started kicking him around the park a fair bit um, and maybe he was playing a slightly different game. So he went off the boil slightly, which is understandable when you look at his age. But last night's performance and some flashes this season shows us exactly what wee Frimpong can do. Uh, and I love the wee guy, I think he's absolutely tremendous. And I hope we can get more of that out of him. I think last night, uh, Steve and I were talking about forget, forget about, if possible, his defensive duties because I don't see him as a defender. I think Mickey Johnson's the same when he comes in. I don't see him as a defender either. So we might have to take that one on the chin um, in terms of what he's going to be doing from a defensive uh, aspect of the field. But what he gives you offensively makes up for that. I'm pretty sure you'll, you'll agree now. Matt McGurn is unhappy, he thinks that Lennon is genuinely deluded. How can he come out after the game and say we played well? I'm very worried about Sunday and also the Rangers game. Uh, Rangers could beat us by two or three. What do you reckon about that then? I mean, obviously last night, uh, Rangers who will be one of our main challengers this season, along with Hibs, I think. They had a fairly convincing result last night, didn't they, in Europe? So uh, they, they'll be buoyed by that. They're playing Motherwell at the weekend. We don't tend to talk too much about them. We certainly don't do the old clickbait thing about them. I'm not interested in a lot of the stuff that they're up to, to be honest with you. Uh, but if we're talking about any of our competitors, then obviously they will come into it. And we need to be interested then. Um, 
it's hard to say. It's hard to say. I mean, Celtic, I think it says it all that we've only dropped points once this season. We've only failed to win a game uh, domestically once. Ah, it was a de- very disappointing game. Of course it was. But um, we're not playing particularly well and we're still winning. And I think that says a lot as well. Whereas perhaps teams like Rangers are playing at the absolute optimum at the moment. Um, so there, there is going to come the time where Celtic start playing uh, at their optimum and perhaps the, the team starts to level out in terms of the, the personnel because we've seen a lot of changes up until now and the team that I think is the best team will be different from a lot of you guys who are tuning in today. So when Lennon comes out, I think it would it would be understandable for him to make these comments. He's not going to criticise, I don't think, um, under the circumstances, he's going to criticise the team after last night, particularly when we need to prepare for Sunday. And the games are coming round so thick and fast and we're into the next round. And we know that uh, it's the first time Riga have lost a game there. It was interesting how the, the Scottish media pundits were referring to Riga as a, a brand new side and all this kind of stuff that just so happens that we're playing in the same stadium uh, because obviously we, we don't have the same attitude to new signs playing in, in Scotland as well. Uh, Billy Beard, Taylor's not good enough for Celtic. Right, you're entitled to your opinion, but what we like to see, Billy, is we like to see a wee bit of substance to that. So why isn't he good enough? Why isn't he good enough? I've got my own opinion on on Greg Taylor and um, to say that he's not good enough, is he a good enough left back? Is it just that he's getting so much of the ball in the final third? Does that make him not good enough? Because we would expect our left back to be in the final third um, as much as Taylor is. Or is it just that he is still adapting to that role? Uh, let me know your thoughts on Taylor's performances so far. Now, free speech for the dumb. We see uh, comments coming in from you regularly, so thanks for getting involved via YouTube. Last week, Spurs were getting beat with 10 minutes to go by a team I'd never heard of. There's no very easy games now in Europe. We are through, job done, on to the next game. It would have been a bit of a disaster if we got beat last night, but we didn't, all right? So, obviously, after a game, we don't just ignore any of the deficiencies. And I'm sure that Lennon and his team will be looking at every single kick of that ball and how we can improve. Again, people might think this is just too basic, but I would counter that by saying that uh, the status, as great as stats are, as fantastic as statistics are, we're getting to the point sometimes, I feel, that you know, what's the point in playing? Because you can tell us what's going to happen. Just fire all your stats into a big computer system. It's like war games. We don't even need to play the game because you know better than us. There's so much more to the game than that. There's instinct, you know. There's winning a game that you should lose. There's losing a game that you should win. All down to instinct, all down to bad form, all down to errors or an individual bit of brilliance. Who saw Frimpong's performance coming last night? Who could have predicted that Frimpong was going to be the best player on the pitch last night? We knew what the boy's capable of, but this is where we need to use the stats, but we can't fully rely on them. So what you're saying last night is, is right. We're through. We got through. It wasn't a great performance. We were totally dominant. 71% of the, the, the possession. Have a look back at the game where we beat Barcelona in 2012. And I don't mind harking back to that. It was a monumental result. Look at the possession. I mean, it was so uncomfortable as a Celtic fan that that night. It was a backs-to-the-wall performance. And I've spoken to Celtic fans who wouldn't like to play that way very often. It was a a needs-must against potentially the best club in the world. And we won. Um, But... It was probably 70-30. It might have been 80-20. Um, that's how dominant Celtic were last night on the ball. That's how dominant Celtic were against Riga last night. 71-29. Um, but then someone might counter that by saying we need to create more chances. I agree with you, we do. But we created three brilliant chances in the last 10 minutes, all created by Frimpong. And um, we had some speculative chances in the first half. McGregor and Cham striking from, from distance. Do we need another winger in the same kind of mould as Frimpong who is that winger to play on the left Mikey Johnson eventually maybe not um, is he the player that can uh, craft open a defence uh, he's a guy obviously that scored I think against Sarajevo last season I don't think he'll be back 
for this tie. If he's not the player, do we bring in another left-sided player such as the Affer referenced uh, Paddy Roberts? And I'm just waiting for everybody to tell me to get over Paddy. Um, but he is the type of player. He's the type of player that can do that on both sides and both flanks. And um, Pat Burns or Burns, please tell me if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, Pat. Thanks for getting involved. The performance wasn't great, but we won away in a knockout round. We will get better. Cam needed from us, Tim's. Yeah, Cam is needed. I mean, obviously, we don't want to talk about the what-ifs last night, but we did get through. Uh, thanks, John Sweeney, for letting me know the sound's OK. Everything at this end seems to be OK. Um, it may have been at the the other end um, where someone wasn't able to hear us. Uh, now, Brendan Donaldson, here's a wee thing. Lennon seems to have aged recently. Looks like he's under a lot of stress. Behind the scenes trouble. Now, Brendan, I don't like to speculate about that, but um, I bring up your point because I do feel that it's relevant. It's relevant because we're all under an immense amount of stress, just in day-to-day life, because of where we are. The fear of the unknown. Uh, We all know about it. We all know that um, it's affecting a lot of people in many different ways. But the fear's a massive thing, isn't it? Um, Where are we going from here? Is there going to be another lockdown? Is my job safe? Is my business safe? Can I pay my bills? Um, Is my family safe? Are my parents safe if they're vulnerable? Um, what's the government doing to support uh, society, communities, the vulnerable, uh, those with mental health issues? So many issues are being created or have been created through this pandemic. We'll get through it. We definitely will get through it. There will be casualties very, very sadly and unfortunately. People are losing their battle um, against that stress and against that anxiety and the pressure that we're all under on a day-to-day basis. Um, now, I'm no expert, but we try we try and highlight uh, mental health issues on the podcast as often as we possibly can. Uh, we speak to Stevie Mullen about it, because Stevie runs Rock Talk, which uh, takes place at, at James McGrory Park, which is a home of St. Rocks, where he gets a group of people. Now, it can be anyone, but at the moment, it's mainly men who are attending uh, rock Talk on a Sunday and uh, if you're in the area of the Gangad, if you're in the area and you feel that things are getting too much for you get in touch, we'll put you in touch it may be that you just want to talk it may be that you just want to go along and be in among people um, and it's obviously done with all social distancing um, observed uh, and sanitisation it's all observed but it's important that the people who are struggling are able to speak about it It really is important that um, people can reach out and uh, get the support that they require. So it's a good point that you bring up, Brendan. Um, We need to be aware as football fans that the the team that we support and the people who are employed to do that job um, are under extreme levels of stress at the moment. So uh, did... Neil Lennon looked a bit stressed last night. I don't want to start saying that because I know that he said his own mental health battles in the past. Maybe in the present. Um, Does it ever leave you? Um, Probably not. Um, I think people start to learn how to deal with it better. So we need to be aware of that. We can't just throw everything at Neil Lennon all the time. We can't just throw things at players all the time. It affects these people. They're human beings like you and me. They may be in privileged jobs. They may be in dream jobs. Um, uh, getting paid a lot of money, but stress still, you know, it's still there. It doesn't avoid people because they are more privileged than others. So, yeah, I did actually think he, he looked a bit stressed after the game last night. Um, and you know, I've got a lot of time for Neil Lennon as Celtic manager. I support him. I support him after last night's game. I criticised him after the Ferenc Varos game. I stand by that criticism. I think it was balanced. It wasn't just for the sake of trying to throw uh, Lenny under the bus I don't want him replaced I'm not calling for him to be sacked I never have done since he came back and uh, actually respond I try and respond to any messages that come through overnight I try and do that first thing in the morning on the broadcast and there was a comment from Sean overnight saying that Neil Lennon was the luckiest manager in British football well I hope he continues to be lucky because every domestic 
competition that he has entered since he came back. He's won it. Um, there's been a couple of uninspiring displays this season, but we're still there. We're still in every tournament that we've entered other than the Champions League. This is obviously a drop down from there, but we're still in Europe. And uh, obviously we still have a game in hand. We're a point behind in the league. And I think that uh, we need to realise that it's difficult and we are all working under extremely difficult circumstances. And Neil Lennon is the exact same as that. Um, I don't think that it's helpful when pundits, credible pundits, respected pundits come out and say things without any kind of weight, such as certain players are uninterested. That's a statement. It's not an opinion. That is a statement. So where are they getting that information from? That Ayer and Eduard and Julian are disinterested or they've got an attitude problem. It's not helpful to anybody. Uh, So I don't subscribe to that unless there's any basis to it. Uh, And also, when you're looking... Um, when you're looking at uh, Neil Lennon last night, yeah, he seems a bit stressed out. Of course he does. But, you know, flying over there, the 90 minutes was a stressful 90 minutes for us all. Pretty sure you'll agree. Pretty glad it didn't go to extra time. And then straight after that, you're thrown into a press conference. So he's maybe not looking as uh, pristine as he normally would. And hopefully him and the team can get back and rested for Sunday. Uh, Neil Lennon, for me, is still the man for the job. I'm back in Lenny. I will criticise Lenny at other stages of this season, but I've never asked for him to be sacked and I'm not asking him for him to be sacked. I think he is the man to lead us to 10 in a row this season. Now, Kenny, a start would be to deploy our best players in their rightful positions instead of shoehorning midfielders into the team, which is having a negative impact on the team's effectiveness. That comes from Kenny McAdam. Now, Kenny, I think... um, you're probably right. I think some players are being shoehorned in. It's difficult, actually, within the middle of the park, I think, to to establish what is the, the best selection. Um, and then added to that is the fact that Tommy Rodgick's back in the first team squad. He was on the bench at Livy. Uh, Turnbull's come in. He's got to be looking for a jersey. And I don't think there's many, if any, I don't think there's many empty Celtic jerseys these days. I think that the first team squad's been trimmed a wee bit. I think that the five players we've brought in are all first team players. Um, We've not bought any projects in this window. Uh, They're all vying for a jersey. And the midfield is where we have more players who are pushing for a first team start. Uh, Some players seem to be getting shoehorned in. I still don't know what uh, Ryan Christie's best position was. I was was completely convinced that it was in that support man role, you know, in front of the, the midfield two of McGregor and Brown. Uh, I've been advised by those who look at the stats that he's very effective on the left. People would, will disagree uh, just with me saying that. Uh, I, I certainly think we need someone on the left who's going to balance the side. So we've got Frimpong out in the right. And at this moment in time, after last night, he'll be in my team on uh, Sunday without a doubt. But I would like to see someone on the left. We've seen El Yunusi out there. Is he the player out there? Again, he's not performed this season, I don't think, as well as he did for spells last season. So is his best position in the centre. But then you've got Christy, El Yunusi and Encham all looking for the same jersey then, aren't you? So who's the best out left? Who's the best in that support role behind the front two, if we're playing two up front? So, you know, it is about identifying the best positions of players. And I never like to, unless absolutely necessary, play anybody out of position. That's one thing that that I would definitely try and avoid. And we've done it in the past and we've done it in big games, unfortunately. Now, Tam Mannion. Thank you for getting in touch, Tam, uh, via Facebook. You're asking what my thoughts are on the level of abuse aimed at our management on social media. I love constructive criticism and reasonable debate, but I was sickened last night with the vitriolic nature of the abuse. Yeah, seen a wee bit of that myself, Tam. I mean, after the game, obviously... Uh, what we do with a Celtic state of mind is we have the the post-match reaction. Sometimes you're you're still emotional at that stage, aren't you? I mean, uh, we were emotional in a good way after, uh, you know, getting that last-minute winner. It was great. Uh, We were jumping about in here in the studio and there was a sense of elation and a sense of relief as well. Um, So I think what happens now, Tam, is that people just vent. They just vent instantly. I mean... It's not nice to see. It certainly is not nice to see. And uh, I think that the level of abuse is over the top. To answer your question, I think it's over the top, Tam. 
I think that uh, we won the game. Wasn't convincing because we only scored one goal and it was a last minute goal, but it was it was a dominant performance. I've got to agree with Neil Lennon. It was a dominant performance. Now I've got the ability, obviously, to think about this overnight and uh, wake up this morning and have a look through the articles that have surfaced online through mainstream media and also fan media because there's some great um, insights from fan media and uh, there's some ridiculous ones as well. Um, and then I'm able to then have a, a balanced discussion. And I say discussion, obviously, we're, we're not chatting as such, but have a balanced engagement with people like yourself, Tam, and everybody else who tunes into a Celtic State of Mind. So I've got the the benefit, really, uh, having a wee bit of that time. But we do go straight, as soon as the final whistle uh, is blown, we do go on for half an hour after the game or 20 minutes, depending on, on the level of um, input from you guys. And um, it was busy last night. I think we got about 8,000 just on YouTube uh, tuning in after the game. Thousands more on Twitter as well. So thanks, everybody, for your support. But it's all about you guys as well and getting your points across. Now, what happens, Tam, is... On the, on the actual platform that we're using here, the the comments that appear on the screen, so the fact that you're appearing on the screen is because I've clicked on your comment. I've not got the best eyes in the world, but uh, I can see the screen that's directly in front of me. Uh, from time to time, I've maybe clicked on a um, an inappropriate comment uh, by mistake, and I try not to do that. So I am filtering it, but that's not to say that if anybody makes a comment on our broadcast that's very good, that I'm ignoring it. It's just that there's so many. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds. I think on, on one occasion there was something like 800 comments made. And if maybe 10, a dozen or 20 people are making similar comments and try and pull one that uh, we can then discuss as well. And I do try and get as many people involved as possible. Um, but my thoughts on a level of abuse aimed at our management team is that it's over the top. But I think that social media is at that stage anyway. There's no policing social media, you know. Twitter and, and Facebook and that, uh, they pull various things if they're reported and, you know, if they're offensive or abusive, etc. But there's so much abuse that isn't deemed by their kind of restrictions and their conditions to be offensive. And I think it is, it's offensive, it's abusive, and it's not very helpful a lot of the time. I think what people need to start doing is to try and get a bit of balance because we can't be sycophantic to the club. We can't just accept everything that uh, happens and say that it's great. We've got to have a critical eye on it. So I totally agree with you, Tam. But it, again, it does it does need to be balanced, doesn't it? I think what we need to do is we need to look at some of the people who do it well. Uh, and sometimes they are mainstream media. Um, who does it well? Because obviously after a game, uh, after a live game, you're going to have pundits talking about um, what was done well and what was done um not so well. And I think when you're looking at that, what was my main criticism going into the game after seeing the team? Well, I would have liked to have seen a Yeti starting. I would have liked to have seen two up top. Uh, that was my main criticism. But then, uh, what can I say Lenny did well? Well, we were never under any real pressure, were we? We were never under any real pressure. So did he set the team up well enough? Well, he did because we won. Um, the substitutions, one was forced, turned out to be a fantastic substitution with Frimpon coming on. But the other ones weren't forced and they were made, you know, tactically by Eleni and the management team. So he brings on El Yunusi, he scores a winner. He doesn't bring off, uh, he does not bring off Christie because obviously when a Yeti comes on, you're looking at um, either Incham, I think, or Christie to come off. Um and he brings off in Cham, who had had a good first half and maybe a quiet second half. And if he doesn't do that, and if he brings off Christie, do we even have that move to score the winning goal? So that's the credit that I would give Lenny. I would maybe have um, criticised the initial selection of not having two up top, but then we win the game. So you've got to be balanced. The level last night, I've seen people calling for Lenny to be sacked, you know, and it's just that level of abuse and uh, hysteria, which is obviously the headline on the broadcast, I think is over the top. I, I really do. But then what I often find is that there are enough um, voices out there who are voices of reason. So then what happens is the Celtic support almost starts policing itself with the voices of reason. Um, and then there's been other times, to be honest with you, Tam, where I just, 
I go home, I put the phone up the stairs and I don't look at it again until the next day because I know what's coming um, and I know the level of vitriol that's going to be used when speaking about Lenny and Celtic and sometimes I decide not to even look at it, never mind get involved. So as sometimes I think it's self-policing um, is the answer. Now Gary McDowell, uh, AC Milan, Baal and Tottenham struggled to win last night against unknown teams and we put unknown in inverted commas don't we Gary because we are all coming round to the, the way of thinking that uh, there, there is very very few easy ties I mean going back a few years now but Lincoln Red Imps anybody remember that how could you forget first competitive game under Brennan Rogers um, and I it's decorating 180 minutes against Ferenc Varos and Riga and we have only scored Two goals, I think that shows you a couple of things. Um, someone made the point earlier about it being a knockout game, you know, a one-off. Had that been the first tie of two and we were bringing them back, we'd be very happy with it. But um, the games have been stuffy in Europe. They really have been stuffy. And I think that that we added bit of creativity uh, on the opposite side from Frimpong um, is what's been obvious, you know, to open the games up. I think we need to have that option we're left heavy a lot of the time. We go right and we're getting something out of Frimpong all night last night. You know, it would just be brilliant to have that option on both sides. But I don't know if I've got the personnel at the moment. Is El Yanusi that man? I don't think so. Um, I, I do like him. I, I want to see him in the team. I don't think that's his position. Is Mickey Johnson going to be that man when he comes back? Well, how long is it going to take for him to get back into the swing of it? Okay, so uh, these these are the things that I think we need to consider and um, there are loads, absolutely loads of comments coming through. So let's have a look at some more. Gary Doonan. Will Hibbs put up an 18-yard line wall on Sunday or will they go for it? Good question. Now, we do have a few Hibbs fans who come on to the Axon Bulletin and because they make good balanced comments, they're more than welcome. So uh, let us know what you think if you're tuning in, any Hibs fans. How do you think Hibs will line up? How did Jack Ross's teams line up before? There's a question, Gary. Um, I know that he gave us good games when he was in charge of Alawa and St Mirren, didn't he, in the Cups? Um, did they give us a game? I think St Mirren probably did, didn't he? But uh, we'll see. I think, I think Hibs have got enough going forward. I mean, who gave us a game this season? Who came out and tried to play us and, and uh, didn't go tight at the back Ross County perhaps um, I disagree with Demet Desmond I don't think that we were flattered by 5 nothing. I thought we were totally dominant in that game yeah they had a few chances in the first half they were lofting balls over the, the back three who were getting to know each other uh, the wind was carrying them on and you know but we won 5 nil. so good point Gary let me know what you think everybody um, is or are rather Hibs going to line up defensively against us on Sunday John Sweeney Thinks that Eddie is frustrated with Lennon when he keeps playing a midfielder up front to partner him. Still waiting for a Yeti to partner him. Well, listen, I am totally up for that. Let's get the partnership working between a Yeti and Eddie because I think that um, there was a huge part of last season, wasn't there, where um, everything was, was being carried by Eduard up front. And, you know, Lenny's made the, the comment himself, sometimes we forget he's only 22. Um, it's a lot... It really is a lot of responsibility for the 22-year-old to be carrying up the front. He's getting uh, singled out sometimes for the treatment as he did against Dundee United where, you know, niggling kicks, niggling nudges, etc. catch up with him. Um, he's been numbered out in terms of uh, three men marking him. He's, he's bringing the ball down, he's got his back to goal and he's got to try and negotiate three defenders. How good would it be if he could just drop that off or knock it off to a Yeti? I think that is a must for Sunday. Um, now, we asked for Hibs fans to get involved. And Paul Colquell has answered the call. Welcome to the show, Paul. And um, he's saying that Hibs played with two strikers on Sunday. So that might suggest that they're going to come out and give us a game on Sunday. Um, it's a better spectacle, isn't it? It's less frustrating for Celtic uh, fans to watch, you know, trying to break down a loving men behind the ball. So let's have a look at that, and that will be interesting to see. Um, now, Celtic Rab, a long-time supporter of a Celtic state of mind. Good to see you 
uh, Rab, good to see you getting involved. Um, High Bees could get a result on Sunday if they come at us. I'll tell you what, there'll be goals in it if they do. Eh? Um, it'll be interesting to see how they line up. And uh, finally, I'm going to say finally because we've been on for about 70 minutes and it's all been me doing the talking. Uh, one of the guys who often helps me out is Kevin Graham. He'll be back to us on Sunday. He'll be one of the match day pundits on Sunday. Kevin Graham says that Jack Ross will do what he did with Aloua and St Mirren. High press when required and well organised. Yeah, let's hope he does because I think that um, that suits us fans a wee bit more as well, doesn't it? So, I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to Sunday and we will have a whole panel. I think there's going to be three of us. Kevin Graham, you're going to be one of those guys who are involved. Just a wee reminder of some of the other things that we're doing at Celtic State of Mind and... um, one of the announcements that I made today is that uh, we're at the very final stages. We're putting the, fi- the finishing touches uh, to Forever Celtic. What's Forever Celtic? That is a book that we are publishing. It's been two years in the making. It's been a collaboration between David Potter and Tom Campbell. I'm editing the book. Can you believe that? I'm editing a book that's been written by lo- those two um, aficionados of Celtic history. But you know what? Sometimes even the best writers in the world miss a wee comma here and there. And it's always good to have an extra set of eyes on it. So I'm currently giving that the last read through and it'll go back to the guys um, to do the final proof read. Um, Finishing touches to the front cover. And now I remember John Squire saying that he was just doing the finishing touches to the front cover of the third Stone Roses album and we never saw it. But I can assure you that you're going to see Forever Celtic. We're going to sell it directly. Um, And that means that it's going to assist us uh, as... A Celtic state of mind, and you know, it's going to help fund what we do on a daily basis. So, there will be other opportunities for books. We're not going to just churn them out like some other publishers who shall remain nameless. We're not going to churn them out just for the sake of it. But if someone comes to us with a good concept um, and a good book, we will publish it for you. So, we're looking forward to that, and it'll be out in time for Christmas. So, buy it for. Uh, the loved one who loves to read about Celtic and it's, as I say it's, a, it's an excellent wee book um, and you will enjoy it so all that's left for me to say is a big thank you to each and every one of you for helping me through the bulletin uh, as a solo artist today and I will join you again on Sunday for a Celtic State of Mind where we will look towards the game against Hibs so thank you all have a great weekend and I'll catch up with you again soon 